gold trails and ghost towns. Share the adventures of our early pioneers as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. I'm Mike Roberts with Bill Barley, our storyteller. Uh, he's uh, been a placer miner in the past, author, historian. And today we're going to take a look at, a, a, I guess, an extension of the Fraser River country. We've done Yale. We've talked about Lytton. Yeah. But if we head up to Fraser, we get to more fascinating country. Yeah, when you, get, when you go along the Fraser, you go from Hope, which is an interesting old town, then up into Yale, and then up past Boston Barnes, Spasm, and then up past Lytton. Then you get to Lillooet. But beyond Lillooet, Mike, about six or seven miles north of Lillooet, is one of the most fascinating areas of British Columbia. And this is the Bridge River country. And when you talk about the Bridge River country, in other words, it's almost synonymous with it, that's Bray Lauren. And when you talk about Bray Lauren, it's the greatest mining camp in British Columbia, bar none. Now, Rawson was renowned, and so was Nelson, and so was Sandon, and Phoenix, and Greenwood, and a, a, a score of towns in British Columbia. But as far as producers of gold ore, nothing could match Bray Lauren. So this is what we're concentrating on today. Okay, the area just north of Lillooet, the Bridge River country, when we come back. Mike Roberts with Bill Barley, and we're heading to the Bridge River country. A uh, Bridge yep. River, I presume, a tributary of the Fraser. It is a tribute of the Fraser. Flows in from the from the west side of the Fraser, as I say, about six miles north of Lillooet. And Mike, we look at three periods of history in this Bridge River country. We look at the Indian history, then the placer mining history, and finally the load mining history. All of them fascinating. And you know, uh, years ago, I was always interested in that Bridge River country, and, and I remember driving down from the pavilion side, you know, along that old road there, and looking across the river and seeing an Indian village just above the Bridge River and a natural plateau, uh, you know, a town site that should have been there. And, uh, and I was going on to Lillooet and on to other things, Cayuse Creek and other... So I came back a few years later, and, you know, I looked down the river again, and this time it was fishing season. And the Indians were down, as they had been for centuries, Mike, fishing by the river. And the river there is, is really an amazing piece of the Fraser River. You hear a lot about Hell's Gate and how vicious it is and so on. Nothing can compare to in Hoiston. The Indians call that in Hoiston, which means foam water or white water place. And it is the most uh, brutal part of the Fraser River. Anyone who ran that river, in the 1859-60 era, they didn't emerge alive. You could run, you could run a Hell's Gate, Mike, and make it, and most people did. You could not run in Hoiston. And I remember going down, this was 1900, and about 1970, Mike, and I went down and, and I was looking down at the Indians with, with, through binoculars and watching them. I guess they thought it was a fisheries officer at the time, and uh, wandered down into their camp, and they were doing things they had done for hundreds of years, Mike. The women were, were, were drying the fish, and of course, prior to that time, the women would do two, ma major, mostly two jobs. They'd dry the fish, and in their spare time, which really wasn't much, they'd make Indian baskets. And the men, their job was to fish out on those rocks. And one false step, Mike, consigned to oblivion, never to return, because you could not, you could not uh, extricate yourself from that river at that particular point. Uh, entire province of water coming yeah. through that oh, gorge. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How far across is that? Well, it's probably about a quarter of a mile. It, it, and the water hisses all the time. You can hear it coming through there in a, in a concentrated sort of form. Something like uh, another river we mentioned in the past, which is the old Pond Array. But um, really, it is an intriguing part of the Fraser. And then later on, the Indians built a village up top, which I mentioned. And I went up there to look at the village. And unfortunately, the old church of St. James, which had been, I think, the, the, the main part of this village, was gone. It had burned 48 hours before. Who do we owe these photos to then? What's well, the... well, a guy called Bill Squibb, I would sent him in. He was a freelance photographer, and a very good one. And he took pictures from inside the church, and it was wide open. Inside the church and outside the church, and captured the church just hours before it burned. And evidently, it was, a, it was an arson fire, and uh, nobody knows exactly who was responsible for it. But that, that particular village is kind of interesting, too, because that, after the Indians, and the Indians have always used this spot, but after the Indians were there for centuries, then the white miners slowed up that river in about 1859. And when they came to the, came to the junction of the, of the bridge and the, and, the, and the Fraser, they started going up the Fraser. A lot of them went straight up the Fraser. Some of them went up the bridge, Mike. 
and the bridge because it was a very coarse gold river. There were nuggets in the bridge up to uh, a quarter of a pound. So it was an extremely coarse gold river, and they established a little town right where that Indian town was. So that was originally a plaster mining camp, then it became an Indian camp, or an Indian town, or a small village, you see. And as these plaster miners came up, they came across terrific ground. Here's an example, Mike. They had to go What's along this? that road. That was the first Caribou Road. Uh -huh. This is not the second Caribou Road that goes up from Yale. This is the first Caribou Road that comes through Fort Douglas and, and Seton Lake and all through there and up through Lillooet and then goes up towards the Caribou. Who do we owe this etching to? Well, I'm not sure who the, uh, who the artist was, Mike. Uh, it came out of an old book, 1860s, 1860s book, and it shows... Uh, one of the wonders of, uh, of British Columbia at that particular time. And this, was, this is the road that's on the east side of the Fraser that uh, the yes. people were coming down. Just, ac just across from Bridge River itself. This, this fellow also, uh, he used his etchings to capture the moments. It looks like these prospectors are dancing here, but uh, probably a toast is being drunk. Oh, sure, here. they're drinking a toast. Any excuse to drink a toast, Mike, and these guys are drinking a toast in one of the halfway houses or one of the, one of the road houses on the Caribou Road. And this is really quite a remarkable... Um, portrait by an artist who was there. The accommodation was kind of interesting as well. Uh, oh, sure. Just a major fire in the back, and uh, you slept where there was space on the floor. You slept anywhere you could. You slept on top of the bar. You can see some guys sleeping <laughs> on top of the bar, some right in front of the fireplace. They were there first, and, the, and the, as you came in later, you slept farther back from that fireplace, and you weren't too warm. So these guys were interesting men, but the interesting part of it, Mike, is these plaster men were smart, too, because when they worked up a river or a creek, so they worked up the bridge, and they found the gold was, was very good to a certain point. Then they figured, okay, that's coming in from a tributary. So they started working some of the tributaries. And one of the tributaries was Canyon Creek, another one was Gun Creek, another one was Cadwallader Creek. And probably the best tributary is Cadwallader. And that's named after the Cadwallader family, still in that area, long time people in that area. And one of the Cadwalladers went up Cadwallader Creek looking for a ledge where he thought the original gold had come from. Because plaster gold breaks off, usually from a quartz stringer, and then it breaks off and it rolls down that creek, Mike, and eventually it comes to rest in the creek, and as the water goes over it and the gravel goes over it, it knocks off most of that quartz. And then the miner would dip in with his pan, a pan like this, perhaps, in this area. What kind of pan is this? Now, this is uh, different than the uh, usual pan. Well, that's a perforator to punch pan, and what it is, is this pan goes over top of an ordinary pan, and yeah. it saves the miner a lot of work. So he would, he would put all the gravel in here with his ordinary pan underneath. Yeah. And then he would shake both of them together, and the black sand and the gold being heavy would go through to the bottom. And then he'd take out all the loose rock, looking for the odd nugget, which, which might be of this size. Not likely, though. Yeah. And then he would take this pan away, put it down, and then pan out with about a quarter of the volume he had originally in this. So it's really a time saver. So this is what they do. Let them go through gravel a little bit quicker. Sure it did. Okay. And so Cadwallader was using this type of thing, and he was going up. And he came across, now this is very interesting, because in the 1890s, Cadwallader came across an old ledge there, which actually an old shaft was sunk right in the ledge. We don't know who dug it before. We don't know who sunk that shaft, and nor did Cadwallader. And that was called the old shaft ledge. That was really the beginning of a magnificent discovery. So he staked some claims in there, and some other guys staked some claims in there, and this was the beginning of one of the, one of the legendary camps of the Canadian West. We're talking what era now? This is 18... 1890s. But really, there was, there was a focus of attention on that area, Mike, in about 1896 and 1897. So they staked some, some, some claims like the, like the Bendor and the Empire and the Elephant and the Wayside and the Woodchuck and the Forty Thieves. And then they staked two other claims which went down in mining history. One was called the Lorne and the other was called the Pioneer. Now, at the time, they didn't know. They didn't know how good these mines were. They all looked good. There was free gold right in the quartz, Mike. And free gold in the quartz means that uh, it's easy for a poor miner to make at least a living. Ordinarily, if there isn't free gold, they can't do it because they have to send it out. This way, the free gold can actually be ground in. And gold was $20.67 a pure ounce at that particular time. So at $27.67 a pure ounce, they had to be able to, to mill their own gold. And, of course, interesting story, Mike, because one of the, there was, there was a two-man crew in there. Old, old man Kinder, a guy called Fred Kinder, was down on one of these claims. I think he was on the Lorne, and he was grinding away with an, with an Arastra, which is, which is really uh, comes from the, from the Spanish-Americans. When the Spanish came in, they had an Arastra, and you can see on this photograph here what an Arastra looks like. It's it looks actually, like the kind of thing you grind wheat with. Uh, uh, same principle. 
So you have that kind of that millstone, and a horse drags it around in a circle, and there's a slight depression in the middle of that arastra, and it grinds it around and around and around, Mike, and all you can do is about three quarters of a ton or a ton a day. That's all. And they, I was going to tell, I kind of drifted away from the story, but there were, there were two guys who had one of these claims there, and it was a pretty good claim. And they, uh, they were approached by an American who said, look at it, he said, I've got, uh, I've got uh, a mill that'll, that'll do a job on this. You guys, you have to get that gold out of there. So they thought, gosh, this is great. Uh, he said, what do you want? He said, I want a third of the claim. And they thought it over and talked it over, and they said, yeah, it's okay. So he came out with a horse and a millstone. He brought him in an <laughs> He arastra. brought in the arastra. <laughs> yeah. And that would do a, a ton a day. Maximum, ton a day, sure. And the interesting thing was, these other two miners, because the arastra actually worked fairly efficiently, they stayed with the proposal. He was cut in as a third partner. And they would grind maybe 190, 200 tons a, a year. That's a whole season. Yeah. Because they probably couldn't do that in the winter. And they'd get 140 ounces, which wasn't bad, you know? Not too bad at all. And no. they might lose some, of course, in the process. And they wouldn't be able to do too much high grit, uh, too much production, but they'd get enough to pay their oh, own sure, bills. Oh, sure, sure. But the thing is, you see, what happened, of course, they used an arast around the Lauren and they used an arast around the Pioneer. In fact, both of these photographs show the arast on both of these places. There's about 1,910 shots from the Minister of Mines book. And uh, it shows these are, the, these are the primitive methods they were using. And so these miners were strung out along the bridge and along Cadwallader Creek and other areas, and they were trying to make, make a go of it. But they didn't have enough, A, to drill, and B, they really needed efficient stamp mills. Now, some of them, such as the Ben Dorr, had a stamp mill, but they weren't really efficient. They needed more exploration money. They needed more backing. Yeah. And, you know, so really what happens is somebody comes onto the scene. By the way, they could use a, they could use a machine like this, too, Mike. Now, this, uh, this looks more like something I would consider a, a mill than the, than the, uh, than the arastra. Well, now, what's, what's this? Yeah, well, this is, this is probably belt-driven originally. Yeah. And uh, you put small pieces of ore in there. Now, what is this? This looks that like is, quartz. That would be gold ore. That is actually a quartz. It's an actual quartz. And sometimes there's a little bit of gold in that particular bit of ore. And so you would have to... Just you, drop it you down drop it down there. Yeah. And then you'd grind away, and it would come out <laughs> in a little pan on the other side. And when you pick up that, that pan on the other side, Mike, then you'd look through it. Let's see what's down here. There's and there. if there was any gold in there, now the easiest way to do it, of course, is dump it in a gold pan. Dump that in a gold pan. Yeah. And then just work it around the gold pan and see how much free gold's in there. And then you can get you can get approximate idea of how many how much value there is in the ore. So this kind of a mill, though, would uh, I mean, would would each individual claim have a mill like this? That well, might be belt driven. Yeah, or this is probably 1890s. Old Mr. Cogram from from. Uh, from Oliver uh, gave me this mill. He thought I should have it. He found it way up in the hills by some mining claims, and it's a real, it's a real little gem, you know. The beauty also keeps oh, yeah. the car on the road during the <laughs> snow season. Oh, yeah, That's about sure 200 does. pounds. Oh yeah, thing. very heavy, very heavy. Now, and you would then take these little bits you'd of dust. You take the residue, and, and then you pour it in your gold pan, which is one of the easiest way to do it, and yeah. just work off the quartz. Quartz is very light, and uh, quartz with gold will stay in your gold pan, and of course the gold itself will stay in your gold pan. So you'd have a good idea of what kind of ground you're in. But all of these things, the arastra and even a little mill like this, yeah. pretty small volumes, yeah. and nobody's going to really get rich doing it. Except, this. Mike, now this, this was such a high-grade camp that when you look at the Pioneer up to 1925, the Pioneer, which was one of a number of claims along there, of course it was one of the great ones, the Lauren and the Pioneer were the two, were the two best, it produced one million 350,000 ounces from 1890s right to 1925. So they did fairly well. Using primitive milling well, techniques. Yeah, essentially primitive milling techniques. Until some guy arrives on the scene and he's the savior of the camp. And this is a guy called David Sloan. And David Sloan comes out of Vancouver. He's a young mining engineer, late 1920s. He drifts into that Bridge River country. He goes up Cadwallader Creek, talks to some of the miners, looks at some of the ore, looks at the formation and says, this is a great thing. And that's, this is where we, we actually leave him. Because it becomes his estimate of the camp. It's absolutely right on. Okay. Take a break here. Be back in just a second and find out how Mr. Sloan interests people to get involved in uh, this little camp on the North Fraser. Do that in a moment. Don't go away.
the mills, which are supposed to extract the gold from this ore, are a little more efficient. Who's this David Sloan, a young engineer? My sure, engineer. and he, he's young, and he's, ex he's not experienced, and so he knocks on a lot of doors. And all those, practically every door he knocks on turns them down. They've heard the gold stories, Mike. They've heard them for years. A lot of them have contributed a lot of money to the mining fraternity, and they're not about to contribute anymore. And so David Sloan is a very persuasive guy, however, and he does get to one guy who believes him, and this is Colonel Victor Spencer. Now, Spencer is the old Spencer family, he used to be rivals of the Woodward store chain. Well, Spencer stores. Sure, right. okay. Spencer stores. So Spencer believes him, and he backs, and he backs our friend David Sloan. And then somebody else moves in on that particular area as well, and this is one of the great, great names in mining in Canada, Austin C. Taylor. And Austin C. Taylor moves in on the Bray Lauren property, Spencer moves in on the, on the uh, Pioneer property, and they really they have the, the heart of the camp sewn up. And all those people who had turned down uh, Sloan regretted it till the end of their days. Because what happens then? Right from the 1900 and about 28 on, they start producing tens of thousands of ounces of gold per annum. Then they start producing over 100,000 ounces of gold per annum. And then they start, the, one of their top years is around 147,000 ounces of gold. Now, Mike, this is incredible production. This is approximately two or three 100 ounce, almost three 100 ounce gold bars per day, seven days a week, 30 or 31 days a month, 365 days a year. It is a legendary camp in Canada. It is really quite remarkable, and it spawned a lot of guys. There were still guys there who had been there at the beginning. And one of these guys was a, was a kind of a transplanted Englishman, a guy called Bill Halemore. Now, we got a photo. This is a photo of Bill Halemore, and you can see him standing next to a oh, rock yeah. wall at the base of his flagship. Sure. And when you, you know, when you talk of, of Bray Lorne and the Bridge River, you can't miss B Bill Halemore, and Bill Halemore is just a dandy. And this, the interesting part about this guy is everybody liked Hale Moore. He had a, a high ethical standard. He believed in people. He believed in the country. But he was kind of a little eccentric. And you see, if you examine this photograph very closely, here's Hale Moore standing there. There's a flagpole in the center of his, of his, of his campground there with his house behind. But around, around that little rock pile there are four machine guns from World War I. <laughs> <laughs> and this, uh, each one of these four machine guns pointed to a, a point of the compass, east, west, north, and south. And usually there was a Union Jack on the flagpole. And inside the cabin, Mike, this is how trusting this guy was, he had three quart bottles full of gold, quart sealers, full of gold nuggets. And you know he never lost a nugget, even in the depths of the Depression? Sounds and like a miracle. Oh, man. yeah. Well, nobody, nobody would ever steal from old Bill Hailmore. Bill Hailmore never stole from anybody else. Classic story about Hailmore, told me, told me by a guy who was there. Mid-1930s, these mines were producing over 100,000 ounces of, 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 of metal per year, the precious metal, the noble metal, gold, over $5 million a year, a lot of money then. Hailmore comes into the office. I think, it was, I think it was of the Consolidated. I'm not sure, but I think it was Braylon Consolidated. He sits down, and some of the company officers are having coffee. He arrived at the right time. He's carrying an ax. And they said, Bill, what are you carrying an ax for? He looks at them, he says, well, he says, I want to sharpen it. So he starts sharpening the axe, using whetstone. Well, Bill, what are you sharpening an axe for? Oh, he says, uh, somebody might want to stake a claim around here. And uh, he was deputy recorder at this time, Mike, okay? So he's an official. He's so he's an official, man, okay. really. And uh, they said, oh, come on, Bill, all the claims are staked around here. They're all recorded. He says, are they? One of the guys looks at Hailmore like this, jumps up, runs to his map, checks the record, one of their key claims was not recorded. They hadn't recorded it. Anybody could have walked in there, picked up that ground, they'd done all the work, all their plant was in place, and legally that would have been the miners, the prospector had done that, would have been his ground, and nothing the company could have done about it. And Hailmore couldn't tell them, because he was a very ethical man, so the only way he could tell them was going with an ax, little start sure sharpening the ax, and had it all figured out. And of course, they were everlastingly grateful to Bill Hailmore. A pivotal piece of ground. Oh yeah, just a just a fascinating guy. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> I love. You know, these guys are a beaut, aren't they? I mean, they're 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 wonderful characters. Well, mining men are a little different. They're cut from a different cloth. You know, there's some very very fine mining men, and certainly Hailmore belongs in that latter category. Machine guns around his Union Jack. Sure. Quarts of gold nuggets in his yeah. in his window, yeah. and. Uh, a, a flair for the dramatic when sure. it comes to hinting. But when I'm talking about great camps, Mike, I'm talking about over 100,000 ounces a year average. I'm talking about, if you roll out that photograph, that's very yes. interesting, because that gives you an idea of how one of the crews on the Braylor oh, and Consolidated, 
in 1939. And this is really quite remarkable. This is Day Crew, Braylorn Mines, October 30th, 39. Yeah. And this was taken by uh, W.V. Ring of Headley. Sure. Look at them all there, smiling for the camera. Yeah. I guess there'd be a, a few of these guys would survive well, to this day. Yeah, a lot of men were killed in the, in the mine, actually. The accident rate was, fatalities were two or three a year, usually through that late 1920s, 1930s, and into the 1940s. But it was deep ground. It was, it, this mine went down several thousand feet, Mike. And some of the ore was so rich, Mike, that it would run six or seven ounces to the ton, and some of it much richer than that. It would average six or seven ounces to the ton, which is bonanza ore. And sometimes it was so rich that they couldn't trust the average miner in there, and they had to erect a steel door made by the company blacksmith, and they'd just cut off that part of the tunnel or that part of the attic because they couldn't let the ordinary guys in there. They'd have to let a pick crew in that they trusted absolutely implicitly. Security. It sounds almost like the mines of Johannesburg in South Africa. Oh, yeah. they, they, it was oh. that rich. Oh, it was. Yeah. It was Phenomenal ground. I, 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 guys, I've talked to guys who worked there when they came across some of this, this bonanza ore, and they just couldn't believe it. Absolutely couldn't believe it. Richest mine in, in Canada or British Columbia? No, richest, richest mine in British Columbia, gold mine in British Columbia. Some of those mines in northern Ontario would have been a little richer, Mike, but as far as the granddaddy of all the gold mines in British Columbia, it has to be in that Bridge River country. It has to be the, you know, between the two, between the Braylorn and, and the Pioneer by far and away the richest mines. And I'm, an, you know, it's, it's funny, when we talk about that country, I've always had a sneaking hunch, and I'm not the only one, Mike, that I believe that there's still a chance, because that was deep, deep ore, and I think there's an extension of that, of that old Braylorn um, property on that Cadwallader Creek area, and that would have mean deep drilling and everything else. And there are mining companies kind of exploring in that area right now, doing some work in there. So it really it began producing seriously once mr sloan found his sure. backers in 1928 yeah w when did it cease production well it really started shifting right down in the 1950s so it had it really had about a almost a, a three decade run and in that three decades of course mike millions and millions of ounces when you consider that their top year which was 145,000 ounces Gold was valued at five million then. Today it would be seventy-five million. Now, it doesn't this mine also have uh, some sort of record for the richest ton of ore? Oh yeah, I mentioned that to you before. The richest ton of gold ore that ever came out of any any ground in Canada, Ontario, British Columbia, Northwest Territories, Manitoba, was out of the Braylorn, and it was running two thousand ounces per ton, and that means one ton of ore about this big produced twenty one hundred ounce bars of gold out of one little ton, Mike. Nothing has approached it, except a little little bit of ground out of Rockland that came close. Remarkable story. It, it goes right by. I mean, everybody remembers uh, the, the Barkerville, and it gets lots sure. of press, but who remembers Bridge River? Thanks the guys who work there. Bridge River and the Braylorn Mines and all of that story. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next time with Gold Trail.